one week to the day after I got this Apple Watch. Uh huh. I managed to scuff it right up. <laughs> well, that's fine. Scuffing adds character. I, you know what? Out. <laughs> speaking of character, it was extremely uncharacteristic of me that I basically said, "All right, self. Now it's just yours." <laughs> It didn't get the glass. It's just the aluminum. That just means it's yours now. This is very, this is, a, I, look, Brad, I'm proud of you. This is, this shows growth and maturity. I, I mean, if it had landed on the screen, we would be having a very different conversation right now. Like my, my feeling on things that you use and that show that use is that the showing of the use, like t- trying to keep everything perfect, like it's new out of the box is a, is a fool's errand. Yes. You're not wrong. Because entropy always wins. You're not wrong. And, um, but, but more importantly, the, the, you, the, the, the device, the thing showing the use is how character is like the neat thing about old furniture and old computers and is that they show the, they show the, 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 the evidence that humans were there, right? Scuffs on leather are like desirable, right? Like, don't you want some weathering? I mean, it depends on the leather, but yeah, like, I don't want brand new. I don't, I don't want my leather stuff to look brand new. I want it to be. Uh, to to show the asses that have sat in that chair and uh, look look I I blame oh, look I blame Apple for elevating the gadgets to the level of fetish object. Well, I mean fetish objects show use too, but that's a different podcast entirely. Mm-hmm. Uh, how are you liking the watch, Brad? It's awesome. I I am way to my I am exercising so much more. Really? Are you yes. feeling your rings? Oh yeah, I I got to bump these rings up. I um I took mine swimming the other day for the first time when I was swimming laps at, at family swim night at the pool. How, how, did, how did that? So I I looked up the sport page for water resistance because of course I did. Yeah. And panicked because I was like, oh, can I just wear it in the shower? Don't do that. Their yeah their their support page basically says water resistance is not a permanent state, and the more that you use it, the less resistant it gets. So I have Apple Care. Okay, sure. So I have two years, basically a year and a half left to burn the burn the water resistance out and torch it. And then yeah. I'm going to give them be like, hey, my watch isn't working and they're going to give me a new one because that's how this works. That's probably fine. Um, but it was it was weird. Like it it felt weird to have a watch on in the pool. But it, but like it tracked. I said I got in the water. I was like, hey, I'm doing a swimming workout. The pool is 25 meters long. Each, you know, each leg is 25 meters and I hit the start button and I swam like four laps and I looked at it and was like, Hey, you've swum four laps. And I was like, Oh, okay. And then I swam some more and it, it like was totally aware of the number of laps that I had swum. The The weird thing about it is it goes into like, you, I'm in the water mode, so you can't interact with it at all while you're in the pool without taking it out of the water mode. And have you, have you, have you taken out of the water mode yet? So that was the the most futuristic thing about this watch is that it literally has a setting that like blasts the water out of the orifices on the watch. Yeah, it just plays sound really loud at a specific frequency to like blow all the droplets yeah. out of the speaker grills and stuff, I guess. It's weird. Does I think I think doesn't the watch like actually say on the face like ejecting water or something while it's yes. doing it? Yes. It's pretty funny. They changed it. It used to be that you had to scroll the 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 crown to do that. And now huh. you just hold the crown, which is much better. I see. It's an improvement. Now I just need to find a face I can live with. What 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 what's what's your you, you like not like in the typefaces they give you, not like in the like I I I'm a so I've set mine up so that I have the Siri face with the like the dynamic, hey, here's what you have next going on in your day with reminders and calendars and stuff like that while I'm on work hours and then outside of work hours, I have one that's just no complications. Oh, will it change faces automatically with your is focus? That, yeah. Part of, part of a focus. I need, I need to dig into the focus stuff. I've completely neglected it, but it sounds very useful. The focus stuff is spectacular. It's really, really good. There's some definitely, there's definitely some issues with it in terms of like conditionals. So for example, if you get in a car, it trumps your, whatever focus you're in and it doesn't roll back to the focus that you should be in based on the time of day or whatever. It, it, that, that part, there's some hinky stuff here and there, but overall, I think the focus thing is my favorite part about the new version of iOS. It seems pretty cool. Uh, I am fixated on using an analog face because I want to feel like an adult. Hmm. Uh, but then it turns out that I am not starts with P. Can you, can you tell me the technical term for needing reading glasses? Pres, presbyd, presbyopia. Some, yes, I think due to that. That either means you're a Presbyterian who can see <laughs> or you have nearsightedness or farsightedness. I can't read the text on most of the faces. and It's a real bummer. Oh, no. 
I well, look. Can I? Uh, okay. When is Apple coming out with eyes? When when are the eye eyes coming no, out? No, you, I'm, no, you don't want the brain implants. So you don't want to be the first one of those. You want to let like like as somebody who bought the very first Apple Watch, I was like, this thing is really cool for about a year, and then it was no longer cool at all because they wore out. Though so you only get one shot at the eyeballs, it turns out probably. So when they get the ice cream scoops, you want them to have the, you want them you want them to have done those a lot. Is all I'm saying. I mean, look, they might scoop your eyes out with ice cream scoops, but it's going to be a really pretty looking ice cream scoop. Welcome to Brad and Will Made a Tech Pod. I'm Will. I'm Brad. We're joined today by a very special guest, my dear friend, and and uh, for well, now it seems like it seems like like two lifetimes ago, Gordon, that we actually worked together. Now, uh, coworker Gordon Gordon Mong from PC World. Hey, Gordon. how's it going? It, it does seem like it was like it was like at least. 10, 10 PCs ago. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> don't you measure PCs in months though? Well, yeah, it was cause for me, it's been fewer PCs than it's been for you. Cause like I, I, I went from upgrading every, like every time there was hardware laying around that it was unused oh, yeah. to, uh, to let's say every two or three years now, I guess like I'm coming up. I'm due though. I'm on a 9,900 K and I'm, I'm, I just got a 4090 and I'm kind of feeling it. Dude, oh, wow. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm still on a 7,700 K. Like what is, what is the average PC's lifespan these days? Like, I'm on. So I, I did swap the chip out of that thing, but the motherboard was bought in late 2015. So you tell me that's wow. seven years of this motherboard. 7,700 K. That definitely is. That's kind of old school. But I will say so the funny thing is I'm running a Skylake box too. I'm using the same cores, but it's Skylake X because it's, you know, who cares? I mean, it's pretty worthless, but I was, I was just doing some testing on it. And it's funny to think like <laughs> how old it is. Like eighteen, this is an eighteen core Skylake. With that was, I think it was like two thousand bucks originally, and you know, Jeez. of course, it got crushed. It got crushed by all the AMD parts that came out soon after. But it just, it's just funny, man. Skylake. The mm. nice thing is, you can't be upgraded to Windows eleven. Some people see that as a feature. Mm. So. <laughs> Every time I open Windows Update, right there in red, you are not eligible, and I'm like, cool. <laughs> well, well, I mean, it's it's interesting because this year. We did a we did an NVIDIA episode last week, I think, where we talked about the 4090. I, I spent a couple of weeks testing and benchmarking and stuff like it's the first time I've had a piece of hardware that made me think, oh, right. I finally need to upgrade my CPU in a really long time, um, which which is like so. So we're going to talk about new CPUs from both Intel and AMD this week for listeners. Uh, Gordon's here because because he's the he's the man for for this sort of stuff. Um, and. We typically for these episodes front load so that people who don't care about how things actually work can just find out what they should buy. Um, so uh, spoilers, I guess, for the rest of the podcast. But wh like, what's the what? Like, Intel and AMD just rolled out new CPUs. What's what? Where where should people spend their money, Gordon? How's it looking? Well, I I think uh, it de it depends on what level you're looking at. So there's like if you are an enthusiast and you want the absolute best. Uh, it's going to depend on, on largely on what you do. You know, one chip has an, an advantage in certain areas. Like I would say <sighs> thinking is, it feels like a month ago already. Cause it was just a few days, but I would say, you know, like honestly, Ryzen 7,000, which was an impressive as hell CPU when it came out, what, uh, four weeks ago, <laughs> uh, it absolutely crushed 5,000. It really sort of, for me, it, made up in a lot of areas that it was very weakened against uh, Intel's 12th gen. Um, I would say that chip still definitely at the high end is um, something you should consider. One, if you want obviously more efficiency, but power efficiency is what I'm talking about. If you want to save more power, which is crazy because when the original 7950X came out, 16 cores, people lost their minds because, oh my God, I can't believe it uses us so much power. It's like, yeah, it's also 40% faster than 5950X. So it doesn't come from nowhere. Um, but I would definitely say it can, uh, it definitely has a lead in efficiency, power efficiency when you're using all the cores. So that's something you should, you'd want to consider for. I would also say it definitely has a slight advantage over Intel's newest top end 13 gen in Many uh, multi-core, multi-threaded applications, but I will say that's not a guarantee. And then 
for you will want to look at sensitivities from the applications that you run to make the proper choice because there's some things that run better on Intel. There's some things that run better on AMD. Uh, it may be so close that you don't care because uh, the advantages for Intel might be something worth doing. And um, again, some things that's actually faster than Ryzen or about the same speed uh, for multi-core, but it has a lot of the advantage and lightly threaded uh, tasks. And also I, I think it's actually very important because a lot of people get caught up in the 3D rendering stuff that is sexy because it uses all the cores. But when you look at Photoshop, when you look at Premiere, when you're looking at, you know, Office and Chrome, uh, 13 Gen has, you know, very decent uh, advantage over a Ryzen 7000, which is still very good, to be honest. But I would say if that's what you care more about and there's actually some, you know, long uh, they've had an advantage for a while because they have worked very closely with Adobe. Uh, they use QuickSync, which is part of the media encoder inside of the IGP. So if you're doing media encoding using QuickSync uh, and you're using Premiere, right, and which is one of the things that leverages it, then you want Intel, obviously. And AMD is behind the department. Ryzen 7000 did bring a media encode engine because every single CPU includes an IGP. But that takes developer relations. That means going, sending people down to work with Adobe, at, you know, all these different companies. And um, AMD is just behind there. They have, they have not had the deep pockets that Intel has had. Uh, and it's frankly Apple and NVIDIA too, right? That's why CUDA dominates generally. That's why Apple has done so wonderful with its new architecture. And they just really, it takes going on and I, I sort of say it's similar to when you go to the grocery store <laughs> And you want to like, hey, I want you to sell my bread. Oh, that's cool. Uh, I'm going to need your worker to come into my store and not only just bring the bread in, but they're going to have to put it on the shelf. So they're going to have to do the stocking because I don't want to pay somebody the minimum wage, the two hours to restock. So I think it's very similar to that. And I know people like to say, it's like, well, that's not fair. That's not fair. But at the end of the day, you can pick your chip based on whatever your own internal, you know, guidelines or ethics are, or you could simply say, I want the fast thing ever. Cause I need, I need this for work. Um, that's mm -hmm. at the high end mm -hmm. at the mid range, like core I five Ryzen five. Um, it's actually uh, far uglier for AMD because they have a six core versus Intel with a core I five 13, 600 K. Uh, I want to say I haven't run the benchmarks yet, but I can already tell you it was on paper and everything I'd seen. It's, it was, it was clear. It was going to be very similar to what I saw with Ryzen 12th gen versus Ryzen 5,000. And, um, you know, six cores versus, uh, 14 cores, even though it's six performance cores and eight efficiency cores. It's just not, it's just going to be ugly. They're both of them are pushing it really hard. So if you're going to do multi-core, multi-threaded workloads, um, you know, Intel definitely is going to essentially crush uh, Ryzen 7,000, 7600X. But here's the other thing though. If you're playing just games, and I like to say just games, because, you know, they actually people make more money than I do playing just games. If you are mostly a gamer and you're not doing all kinds of things like you're recording it and you need to edit it and you don't need that high core count, then honestly, you know, Ryzen is as good. And honestly, who cares? I really have my feeling these days is who cares? Because it's about I'm always going to say put more money into the GPU. But that's okay. kind of how it breaks down. It's it's OK. So I have a two part question. First off, which one is going to launch Photoshop fastest? Because that's that's where like. Of all of the things on my computer that are slow, that is the thing that is consistently the slowest from PC to PC over the last 20 years. Yeah, I would, you know, that'd be interesting. Photoshop launch is not something I have looked at. Uh, I will say all the actions within Photoshop using various different benchmarks, uh, Intel has the advantage. So okay. that is, uh, uh, I don't know about launching speed, but I think I, I think just going to these newer generation of, of CPUs should help that. And of course, it would help to have, you know, a, a fastest SSD. I don't know if we're going to see a difference when we get the Gen 5 SSDs. They're not, everybody's touted them. Nobody's pushed one out the door yet. So we'll see if that makes a difference with direct storage and all that. But again, you know, that that to me is, a, in a way, I mean, again, I don't like to declare one better or one the winner because I don't think there is one winner. I think it just depends on what you do with your computer. And I, but I do think, yeah, if you're Photoshop. If you're in a Photoshop in a Premiere Lightroom, I do. You know, if you look at it, they, it, you know, 13 Gen has a clear advantage over Ryzen 7000. It's not like, oh my God, it's like so much better. 
And frankly, some people may not notice because the Ryzen 7000 is, is a, an incredibly fast CPU too. But if you want to know who's in front, it's definitely 13th gen for those. I feel like I feel like benchmarking the launch speed of Photoshop is the populist angle. That's that's the people's benchmark. <laughs> that's the thing that people actually want to hear. I think Acrobat. You know, it's funny because this is one of those like, you know, there's always whenever, you know, benchmarking is is like it's. It's funny because you always think like, oh, it's just simply numbers. Like, no, there's a lot of politics with it too. And you always kind of wonder like, what are they doing with this? Whenever, whenever you see that Intel talks about like, uh, they, they, cause they, you know, they obviously are in a, in a kind of not nice words with Apple, especially cause Apple was slinging, you know, mud at them. So they slung mud back and you know, like these tests are often pushing is like, uh, convert a document word document to pdf there's like a lot of pdf conversions <laughs> like acrobat is like somehow this like thing is like okay i i guess a lot of people but you know it's really funny it's apparently it's a real like it's a real deal especially if you're using these laptops i guess a lot of people do well, do care about acrobat because it's so slow all the time i mean and and it's a thing that if as somebody who does a lot more business stuff now than i did 10 years ago I do. I spent a shocking amount of time in Word hitting that save this as a PDF or, or PowerPoint save as a PDF button. Yeah, um, but it's not but, sexy, right? That's the problem is everybody's like, well, that's I don't care about that. And it's like, OK, well, you know what? This executive makes way more money than you do. So maybe you should care about it. Nobody's dedicating space on the silicon to Acrobat acceleration. I have suggested that before. So. <laughs> Um, what, what, I want to install a PDF accelerator card in my PC. <laughs> you know, well, you know, I mean, that's, that's the whole part of the whole performance game is there's a lot of, there is an awful lot of politics involved. Like uh, I use Puget Bench a lot. It's a very popular benchmarks made by Puget Systems. There's a workstation maker up in Washington state and they basically, they do workstations. They do intensive workstation testing. You should go read. If you want to buy a workstation, please, please go read all their testing and research. It's invaluable. But they release the benchmarks. One of their tests, which is Puget Bench for Premiere, it, it uses, a, 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 and I, I brought this up, it uses a lot of, oh, my brain is ProRes. So it uses a lot of ProRes in it. And I'm like, well, huh, is that fair? You know, it's an Apple that, codec. Yeah. I mean, that's what people don't think. It's like, it's like, oh, well, you know, M1 is awesome. It's like, well, there's also there, you know, because the, the benchmark that runs on Apple Silicon and it runs on Intel and AMD uses ProRes. And by the way, that's home field advantage, heavy home field advantage for Apple because it's their codec. And you know what? I asked Intel about this because like, hey, how, what's up with the ProRes? You ever going to get any support? Well, you know what? We checked. Guess what? It's not an open codec. So so they you know, can't accelerate. That, well, yeah, but that is that is that like having a benchmark where you're using a codec made by Intel? If you did that, people would freak the f out, right? Like, oh, well, because it's made by Apple. People used diameter for years, though. So, like, yeah. I, I mean, I, I guess the 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 thing to me is if it represents a real life workflow that people are actually using, it it seems fair. Yeah, but it, but it, it is it is always it is always spot uh, kind of fraught. Um, sp speaking of things that are fraught. What's the deal with AMD, with the the Ryzen's and Windows 11 22H2 and the 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 high end uh, multi CCP chips, not uh, CCD rather chips, not working at full speed? Yeah. So uh, what what you're talking about here is there was a report. I think it was out of uh, oh God. I, mean, I don't want to mangle the name of it, but it's a Cat Frame X. They make a benchmarking tool. Um, and they get pretty hot on Twitter at people too, <laughs> by the way. But uh, uh, apparently I think the problem they ran into for people who don't know, uh, in, uh, AMD has long used this, you know, multi, multi chip design and they have uh, on their high end, their 16 core CPUs are made up of, you know, you know, multiple chips connected by an IO die. And it's really ingenious because it, it really lets them leverage uh, silicon across the entire line, saves them money and, a lot of scale to it. Um, so one of the, I think the issues was if you, they're finding uh, in one game so far, I have not had a chance to sit down to look at this. In one game, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, I think if you disable one of the CCDs, because you remember you're splitting the, the core count across two different chips. Um, apparently what's happened, it's, is it, there's a, there's a nice, there's like some kind of performance penalty when using both CDs, whereas you go to one and I, and I have not had a chance to look into this. Uh, in fact, I am fortunately not affected by it because I use 21 H2 because like all benchmarkers, I, 
you, we all kind of like when we talked to Intel about 13 gens, like, do we do we really have to upgrade to 22 H2 for this? Like, are you going to see like night and day performance? Because nobody wanted to start all over again and throw all the previous results out. And they said like, oh, it's a little, little tiny difference. It doesn't, it's not going to matter enough. But um, so I did not upgrade, update to the latest version. A lot of people did not. Um, but they don't really know whether, uh, what the issue is. Is it, window, is it Windows scheduler or is it just simply whoever makes the game needs to, to, instead of basically throwing all the threads across the different CCDs, they should be throwing them at, at the correct one. So it, it could just simply be a patch that has to come out. It's not really clear whether this is like, oh my God, you need to, the whole, this actually came out with the original 1000 series, like, yeah. you know, latency across the, the but, dies and all but, that. But, but it's not an endemic problem with the CPU. It's just with this particular benchmark, it seems like. Yeah, it could be just this particular game and also could be, you know, uh, it could also, I mean, we don't really know again because people are still looking to this. It came up very late in the review cycle for everybody. Um, I, I think okay. it could be Windows, but, you know, because remember the one thing that uh, Intel did is with 13 Gen is they have a new version of Thread Director, which they're not really making a big deal out of, but they are calling it Thread Director 2. And they say it's improved over 12th Gen. And um, it's supposed to offer some improvement. And the mo the best improvement is when you pair it with the latest version of Windows, which is, uh, you know, 22H2. So that, that... Uh, I think it's something everybody's going to have to look at again. So, which kind of sucks again, you know, benchmarking life is just the worst thing in the world because you are just, you like people are like, Oh, you need 40. Cause I use like slow ass 30 nineties for benchmarking. Right. It's like, well, my, what are my chances of like scoring two 40 nineties any day now? So you're not going to like do that. Like, uh, but if you, if you got the 40 nineties, you got to like, okay, let's throw everything away and start all over again. So yeah. it just sucks. And like new version of the operating system. Oh, by the way. Oh, you know what? I, I just retweeted this picture this morning. Hey, somebody was, I think, uh, Kingston has some <laughs> DDR5 7,600 modules. So <laughs> what, what's time. up with DDR5 at this point? Are prices going to stabilize? Are they like safe to buy yet? Or are they still like flaky at higher speeds? Like, I mean, we're, we're just in a memory transition right now. Like, is that, that's usually like somewhat bumpy, right? Yeah. You know, memory transitions are always the hardest. Um, they happen very, very rarely. So people just don't realize how hard it is. Most of the people, in fact, probably even moving to DDR5 didn't have to live through the transition from three to four in a way. So they don't even remember. Right. So, uh, it's ugly. DDR5 of course came in when it first came out, it was so hard to get like vendors couldn't like people building PCs to sell them couldn't get it because there was in, everything was just like literally stuck on a ship. Um, and then most of it was getting into reviewers because it would come directly from, you know, the vendors because they had it and they like <laughs> reviewers can't test it without the Ram. Um, and it has gone from like, Oh, you know, 32 gigs for $700 down to very much being somewhat on pair on, uh, on par with DDR4. Of course, that's not going to be the highest clocked, right? You're not going to get like DDR5 7600 for the same price of a pair of, you know, average DDR4 modules. It has really, really come down in price. Um, and it, this is, and the thing is like earlier, we were talking about CPU performance. If you're making your choice between CPUs, you also have to know like to do uh, 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 AMD Ryzen 7000 chips and its new AM5 socket and to do 13 gen, well, you want you probably want ddr5 however intel is the only one that gives you an option to run ddr4 because their cpu which has a memory controller supports both ddr4 and ddr5 amd chose the route of we're only going to support ddr5 for this next generation of uh, cpus and that that can make it tough it's not not necessarily just the fact that you might have to pay a little more for ddr5 but if you already have say 32 gigs or 64 gigs of ddr4 you could recycle it. You could do a new box. And so that can like, okay, I'm going to do honestly Core i5 3600. Oh God, 3600 X. What the hell is it? 30. It's a, my brain is gone here. 13, uh, 13600, right? 13600 uh, K is really the, probably the chip most people, even if you're an enthusiast, is, is got way more than you ever need. A lot of bang for your buck. You could build that with DDR5 for the best performance. Uh, it'll get better as the memory continues to get higher and higher in clock. Uh, and or if you really like, uh, I got 64 gigs, I want to reuse it. Well, then you could you could do that. You could do 13 Gen Core i5 with 
with uh, Intel. And that's actually, this, it really helps in this cycle, whereas for AMD, they're just kind of caught like, you know, you do DDR5 or, or nothing. And a lot of people are saying, you know, I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to buy, you, you know, one of your awesome 16 core or your X3D part at for these fire sale prices and just upgrade my system and sit here for another few years, which, you know, that's, that's bad. I mean, it, it, there have been a lot of anecdotal reports of 7,000 not selling that well. So, huh. so what's the, uh, sorry, oh, what's the, um, do you know what the sweet spot is for Ram speed on Ryzen 7,000? Cause I know, I know those are especially sensitive to memory speeds. Uh, they, they continually have said that you want DDR5, uh, 6,000. Okay. So that's actually what they seeded all the review units. And, you know, most, I actually did all of my 13th and uh, 7,000 reviews at uh, DDR5 uh, 6,000 speeds, CL32 or CL, I can't remember what the latencies were on both of them, but that's what they recommend. Um, Intel seems like they can, they can hit higher clocks because um, uh, I don't think I've seen anything higher than 6,000 on AMD, but it gets a little weird because, um, AMD now has this thing called Expo and it's their own um, memory uh, spec protocol. Basically, when you put the memory module into your computer, it looks at the it looks at the at this little chip on the on the memory module and it, it tells the motherboard what to set the memory for or what you oh. can set it for. Um, like their version of XMP. Yeah. So it's their version of XMP and they showed this off in Austin when they were, they briefed everybody on, on, um, Ryzen 7000. So it's like a separate path. It's quite interesting. There's a lot of, there's a lot of nuance and politics to it that I still haven't really unwrapped, but their is, rationale for it is like, we, we need to control this. And also, by the way, as part of our spec, what's going to be awesome because we're AMD and we're always open. We're going to make, if you want to make Expo modules, which they're basically saying you have to if you're going to build modules for DR uh, or for for Ryzen 7000, you need to publish the full specifications of the memory. So they like every single timing you have to put it on your page in a PDF. See, there goes the PDF again. Yeah, once again, <laughs> there goes the PDF. There goes the PDF again. You got to put the specs on your website, and people need to be able to see the full specs. And they're like, and their messaging to everybody was like, we're uh, we're not opaque like Intel. And the interesting thing is they say like, hey, we're, we're, we're not opaque. You can see the full specs and there's no royalties. Right? Oh, so they're not charging. They're not charging. For, presumably there's royalties tied to XMP. If you Yeah, so to that's the thing that. is like, they're like, I didn't know there were royalties with XMP. So, yeah. and of course you, when you say like, we don't charge royalties. Yeah. Kind of like, says so like, oh, everybody's charging royalties. I go to Intel's like, yeah. so what's up royalties on XMP, XMP3? They're like, we do not charge royalties on XMP. We have never charged royalties on XMP. <laughs> so, you know, but it's a good way to message it, right? Man, so that's, that is some real shade right there. <laughs> no, that's not, I don't, I don't think, you know, the funny thing is I don't really consider any of, any of it shade anymore. Like, you know, people got all really hot, hot over the 40, 80, 12 gig and, and, yeah. uh, and six, I, it's just to me, it's just part of the business. You know, they, their job is to take your money as much of your money as they can. And our job is to, well, my job is to tell people how to not give them all your money if you don't need to. And, uh, or, and as a consumer, you need to, you need to protect your own money. So I think it's like, I think it's, it's fair. That's how you play. It's just part of the game. I can't hate the player. You can hate the yeah. game. No, no, no. This is, this is the greatest game. Um, but, but like while we're talking about memory, it's, it's interesting because like the only times I've had memory die in my memory has always been memory I bought right at the start of the transition from one one spec to, to the next. So I had DDR3 sticks that died. I had DDR4 sticks that died. Is Are, are we past that point with DDR5 now, do you think? Or do you think we're still in kind of the danger zone? Well, you know, I, I think it was when you're anytime you buy the first generation of, of memory, it's or anything, honestly, it's it's not the best, but I think it's it's hard to say i mean as long as you're getting something with good good warranty and then you do have i mean this is something that has to be said but jetic which is the you know the 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 overseeing committee for memory they have a certain speed it's like what is it is it 5600 i think is the top, i forget what jetic the top jetic speed is there is a top here is a speed it's official and it, anything was, over that is technically overclocking yeah, just like so. ddr4 was technically limited to 2400 for a long time even yeah. though Right, here, here's 3600. Who, who yeah, 2133 is what everybody said was uh, was jet right. speed. But they, yes. you know, I guess technically they did eventually update it to have uh, 3200. 
for memory. But as far as reliability, I think you're okay. I Again, this comes down to buy from a reputable vendor. I mean, if there's some components you're fine going blowing up in your computer. If there's well, like if you want to pick one of the components, you're fine going up. Memory is probably one of the ones I wouldn't care about because that's just memory. SSD going up in flames, that would be very that's of course yeah. the worst thing. And then other power supply going up in flames is also not good. But yeah, can, yeah. can Gordon, can we do a quick lightning round? I just want to ask you your favorite like two vendors per category. Can can we just can we hop mm-hmm. in here and like okay, we could try. Oh, there's a politics. lot of politics. You're gonna get Gordon in trouble. Oh, sorry, I don't want to no, put no, you on the spot. Like. Who were like, okay, we're like Ram, Ram vendors. Like what, what are the, like a couple that you would trust the most? Oh boy. That one's, I honestly, I think probably, uh, oh God. I, I've been, oh, it's, it's, it's funny cause I've been using their memory for all the testing recently and it's just totally not even, this is so, this is so bad. I'm going to look it up because I, I was just saying, <laughs> I was just telling them and, and like, Hey, I'll see you at Computex. Uh, Oh, hang on. There, if there, if there are professional relationships to damage here, then no, no, no. It's skip not. this I just, exercise. I mean, because I mean, again, that is personal. You know, as as a reviewer, you don't. You could like things like I, because we'll get the motherboards, and I'll tell you why I like the motherboard. I do. Yeah. So um, that was my next question: is who who's your favorite motherboard vendor? Yeah, like like I, 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 while you're looking this up, I can talk smack about motherboards. I stopped buying. I was an ASUS guy for a really long time. Uh, and then I stopped buying ASUS boards because their USB implementations were always janky compared to everybody else. Uh, so like there weren't enough, there weren't enough, uh, uh, they, they would do things like, oh, hook all of the USB ports and headers up to one USB root hub so that you were limited to 128 devices across that. And it was consistently a problem. So, or they wouldn't document like how the PCI express lanes are configured when you change like NVMe slots and, and oh, what, cool. based on which slots you use and stuff like that. Uh, so, so it's G skill. Sorry. I just like, okay. honestly, I, I've had. You know, a lot of luck with GSCO lately. They do seem, you know, they they do seem really well. But, you know, again, I mean, number two, probably Corsair because I have great relations with them. But, I mean, the problem with memory is it is, I mean, it's probably one of the most commodity products there is, right? So I don't know if you can hear that. Is that song on my end or your end? I do not hear any music. That's just in your head, Gordon. Oh, he's a circular. Somebody's running a circular saw, I think, in the blog. But no. Yeah. But so like, yeah, Guile and Corsair. Okay. Keep going. Okay. okay. By a motherboard. Favorite see, motherboard. I, uh, and I forgot to say it is just commodity. RAM is really commodity parts. So it's not like it's a, it's a super secret deal or anything. Well, you, but if you want, if you want performance RAM, it seems like you generally have to, there's a handful of brands that are more reliable than. Yeah. So I will say this, like when you mean reliability, I can't speak to memory suddenly not working. Suddenly the machine stops posting, but I can say early on the DDR5 had a lot of teething pains had a lot, a lot of teething pains. Like I had a vendor said, I'm not going to say who they are. They sent me a memory and say, hey, you want to check out this memory? It's like, hey, it won't boot with this memory. <laughs> and it is just, and a lot of it was because, you know, one, people, there's still this thing called COVID in the world. And uh, yeah. number two, it was so hard. Like vendors, they didn't have the boards to test with and the vendors and the motherboard makers and the chip makers didn't have the RAM to test with. It was just very hard to validate the memory. There was just a lot of incompatibilities early on that went on for, I feels like way too long for DDR5. At this point, most of it's got to be nailed down. I haven't had any issues with that lately, but I will tell you like Greg Viederman, who we used to work with, the Veed, he, he was texting me about a problem he had where like, hey, would you be concerned if you got memory and it was, uh, one of them was misidentified, like he would boot the system up and like one was like, so he paid for a higher clock speed. And one was the higher clock speed and the other one was the lower clock speed, but it, it ran fine. And this was a replacement for the other kid he had bought on Amazon where it was unstable. Ooh. So it was like, <laughs> it was like, okay, clearly they didn't either package those correctly or program the SPDs correctly, but that's just, you know, early teething pain, some memory. Well, it, and it's, it's one of those things, the weird, the weird thing about memory bandwidth, at least on my i9 system is that in unreal engine games, j- jacking up the memory bandwidth is maybe the most impactful thing you can do to improve performance on UE4 games. Oh, really? So yeah, you know, maybe buying like investing in good memory. It used to be that investing in good memory was for overclockers. And I think it's less, that's less the case these days. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely, it's, it does apply to some things. 
So that is, I, I think that's the only problem. Sometimes I think people get a little too torqued up over the, oh, I need 70, I need GDR5 7600 for whatever $600 I'm sure it'll cost for a pair of modules. But this is like, <laughs> is that going to really help you as you compile your PDFs? It's like, no, it probably won't. But, you know, it's just. Photoshop's going to open so fast, though. Yeah, I, might, you know, I mean, but there's some applications and games where it does make a big difference. Uh, okay, Brad, I, let's, let's let me, get. Motherboard. All right. For I, favorite motherboard vendor. So uh, you mentioned that you don't like Asus because you have problems. There. Some you have your anecdotal experience was you had problems with their the, how they they do their USB uh, implementations. One USB root hub for ten ports is too many ports on one root hub. I, I also just had my first. I've been building PCs since ninety seven, and my first motherboard to ever die was an Asus about six uh, five months ago. Yeah. Uh, so that's yeah. My number one choice is Asus. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, I knew, okay. like, because I know, like, I mean, that's a problem with, like, oh, well, you know, I had this problem with this Ford I bought in 1998. I'm never going to buy, you know, honestly, I, yeah. my, that's my VW story. You buy one VW is enough for you. That's my, I will never buy another VW because <laughs> that's my experience and that is my right. So I think you're both, you both have that right. But I prefer the ASUS. The reason I like ASUS is I prefer the BIOS. The BIOS is very easy to, or come on, or, I mean, I'm going to say this because somebody out there is, is right now like tis tisking is like the UEFI. Let's just call it the BIOS, okay? The, the the BIOS is just easy to navigate. You can get there. I I can like you know where everything You're is. You're comfortable, like, but yeah, it's, like it's like a it's like a good couch. It's and, and it's very detailed. They it's have very a detailed. tremendous amount of control in there. And it's not like Gigabyte and MSI don't or ASRock give you the same amount of options. But like hell, I don't know where it is. Like, can Look, we just have like a uniform standard for? But they don't. They all call it something else. So because, how about this? Let's let's flip the motherboard one and say and 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 put it the other way. Are there any motherboard vendors you would avoid? Well, there's like, honestly, there aren't that many left. Yeah, right. There's like five, right? I mean, when I first started, there were like, you know, 15 or 20 or more that, and that's yeah. just, that's just in consumers. I mean, there were so many DFI, Soyo, A-Bit, right? I mean, there's just sort of like. I, dude, I missed DFI. I missed, I missed A-Bit. God, yeah. there was like, I will. I just like, there were just all these. And the thing is, they're probably still around. Yeah, tie-in. They're still in business too. They make, you know, server boards, but you know. Consumer facing boards, it's really down to, you know, four, right? It feels like, I guess, I mean, what I consider EVGA, I think EVGA is still a very small motherboard vendor. But when you think about it, it really comes down to ASUS, MSI, and Gigabyte. The, the, the thing, honestly, I want from your UEFI slash BIOS slash the thing where you put in the numbers that make your computer not work is like, I want the idiot mode. I want it to just be like, hey, this is this chip. We know this is what you run on this. Like, this is this is how you run the CPU in a way that's not going to make my room feel like it's it's I'm the inside of a toaster oven and uh, and will not crash when I put load on it. Like, I'll, I don't I don't I don't want to get in. Like, I don't want to have to muck with voltages at this point. Like, I want it. I want it to just know what I'm putting in and be like, yo, here we go. I don't need the extra 3% performance or 10%. Per like I'm fine. It turns Sounds out like eco mode is for you. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean we have, we have to talk about power consumption, but let's uh, okay. What have I, I not done? Power supplies, power supplies. Oh boy. I, so I've had, you know, I use a lot of Corsair power supplies. I haven't had any problems with it. Uh, yeah, same. Uh, boy. I mean, number two, Silverstone, I use a lot of, I did have some problems with a couple during the pandemic and the mining phase where you could not get power supplies. Um, the, but I, I don't know if it was the cabling on those, but, uh, I, you know, generally Corsair, but you know, the problem with power supplies is, you know, most, most people don't know this, but there are very few actual power supply manufacturers, right? You've got like the three or four factories that crank them out and you've got everybody else that if you're mean on Reddit, you say they just put their stickers on them. To be honest, they don't, they do a lot of engineering and it's just like, you know what, that to be. To say that these power supply manufacturers do not make power supplies would be like saying Apple does not make power uh, phones, right? They, they, Apple doesn't make shit either. They just have somebody else make it in a factory. But if you don't think Apple's engineers have any contribution to that phone or that Mac, then you're kind of high, right? Because I, so that to me, it's like very much the engineering that goes into it. It does matter. Yeah, when when Corsair or, or, or Silverstone have their power supplies manufactured they're sending them specs and com a compo like a component list right hey we yeah. want these capacitors and we want right. these these mosfets and all this stuff yeah right and they may i mean they they probably in fact do their own designs right so they you know these the con the the fact the factories basically build a design so it yeah. is they may not physically own the smokestack place but they're still clearly you're getting that power supply in there but they also the same power supply companies 
they may multi-source, right? They may order this model from this factory, that model from that factory. So I do think if you're talking about power supplies, it is important to talk about ATX 3.0, although I don't know if you want to keep that to the power consumption part, but that is something people really need to think about uh, as we go forward too. Because What, what changes with ATX 3.0? Well, uh, ATX 3.0 was basically the first update to ATX in like, I don't know, decades kind of thing. Like you could say like in decades, there have been changes along the way. Um, Intel pretty much makes the stand. They write the standard that everybody uses because by the way, they've long been 80 to 90% of, of PC sales in the world. Um, the main thing that really, there's a few changes. They improve efficiency with it. So um, in a lot of ways, you don't have to buy Intel's new ATX 12 VO uh, 2.0, which is a new spec as well. It used that uses a new connector and that completely eliminates the, you know, three, three and five volt rails, which they just feel like, well, what do you even need these two? Nobody even uses these stupid rails. And the problem with uh, ATX uh, 12 VO is they said, you don't need three, three volts and five volts. Everything's going to be 12 volts out of the power supply, which makes it really, really efficient. Well, what if what do I do for my RAM and SSD? Well, you do the power conversion on the motherboard, so then that started this whole back and forth between the well. Then the motherboard maker has to to put more stuff in the board. They got some pushback from that, uh, uh, but you know the main thing is tw ATX twelve VO, and there's a new one called ATX twelve VO two. Addresses really uh, the increasingly harsh standby regulations from the state of California and Oregon and all the sort of like. Um, you know, Prius states, you could, I guess you could say the ones that would like want to force you to, you know, be more efficient. And it, it lets vendors build systems that meet the uh, new regulations that systems have to really use like very, very low power when idling. Well, it and it gives a data connection between the power supply and the system, right? Yeah, that's VO. Uh, the new 2.0 adds the ability for the power supply to tell the, uh, the system that, hey, you're at 95% load <laughs> and then the system goes like, okay, we're going to slow things down now. So that's kind of one new feature that they've added with that's ATX 12 VO ATX three, three O really just, um, the main thing is it, it, it picked up a lot of the efficiencies from ATX 12 VO. Uh, but, uh, it also added, it was mainly made to address all of the power spikes or power transients or excursions, as I like to call them for some reason, like a trip. Oh, we're going on an excursion, like a, a vacation. Yeah, your <laughs> GPU is going to use 700 watts. Oh, that doesn't sound like a vacation to me. It's an excursion to your power bill. <laughs> yeah, they basically said like, so, okay, for this, you have to be able, the, the power supply has to have the capacitance to uh, deal with a spike that will hit, you know, two times the power requirements of, of the, like there's, it's all laid out in the spec, but you may have to hit like a, you know, 1200 Watts for, you know, 10 milliseconds or, you know, 10 microseconds or something like that. And the main thing is what it really does is it, it actually puts guidelines in place because when for, for AMD and for NVIDIA, for Intel, they make graphics cards. They make these cards that are getting really, obviously, very power hungry. And with th the 3000 series, what you're having with the power supplies, they would spike up and suddenly use a lot of power. If you had this cheap ass power supply, it didn't have big enough capacitors, kapoof, right? You crash. So a lot of yeah. people were having crashing issues. Um, the problem is for the the video card vendors, they didn't really know, like, so how do I, they, they really had no boundaries. So ATX 3.0 adds the, so here are the boundaries. We're putting this in the spec. If you stay within these boundaries and you're using an ATX 3.0 power supply, you're fine. So the one way to do that with a non 3.0 power supply is one, you buy a really good power supply or you oversize it, right? So, cause you're hopefully if you're oversized, they use larger capacitors, capacitors to get you a little more. So that's, and, and, and you have the overhead to absorb those spikes. Is yeah. The idea. I mean, that's the hope, but to me, I, I kind of think like if I'm going to go out and buy an expensive new power supply now and looking forward, I'd probably want an ATX 3.0, but the one thing that everybody got confused about is they thought that GeForce 4000 was going to require ATX 3.0 and it doesn't. It runs perfectly fine on existing power supplies. So in fact, it's it's got even tighter regulation than the 3000 series, which are the ones that were kind of like pushing those, you know, borderline power supplies over the cliff. And this is apparently they've lived up to it and it, you can use your existing power supply, but, you know, next generation, no promises, right? Oh, great. I feel wonderful as somebody who just bought a th very high-end 1,000-watt power supply like two months ago. <laughs> That's in your NAS, though, right? 
No, that was for my desktop. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I was, that- I was one of those people. I'm exactly one of those people he's talking about. I was using, I got a 3080 Founders Edition and I had a, what, eight year old power supply and I was getting crashes and reboots, sure enough. Yeah. Uh, no, because, I mean, because that thing was spiking it past. I mean, it was only like a 750 watt to begin with and it was old. Yeah. And you probably couldn't even see it because you, I mean, like, it would look like it probably wasn't using the power, but you're, yeah. you're, you're they're literally pushing it for just microseconds. And it, yes, yeah. totally. I was watching the voltages. I was like, this seems fine. What is going on here? <laughs> yeah. Yes. You know, and supposedly power supplies don't last forever. They wear out. Yeah. But I don't know if that's true. I, I mean, I guess. I, I, I had to replace one of my daughter's computer the other day just because it, it was six years old. And, you know, it it, it, was, it was it was it was it was crashing on low on high load with a 3000 series card when I think about it. Um, yeah. So anyway, uh, this is actually, I think is important to point out is don't go by 80 plus everybody goes by 80 plus, right? Cause that they, they view that as a sign of, of quality and it. The only thing it endorses is efficiency ratings at four different levels. Um, yeah, so a lot of 10, people, 20 and 50. No, yeah, I think there's it's an 80, 80, 80 85 and 90, I think. Right. Yeah. I forget what it is, but you know, it's basically they have to hit those four points and that's it. We give you the sticker and then a lot of people go, well, that's, I want 80 plus gold. And honestly, it doesn't mean anything except that it hits those four, you know, fairly conservative points. There's a new, uh, competing specification. It's, um, it's called, uh, Edda. I think it's made by Edda, but it's, it's called Cyber netic like think cybernetics but remove oh, that's the r that's a bad name yeah but the nice thing is so they originally they had it they have these you know because uh, the person who created it uh is is greek so there was like they had all these kind of like greek things and you know uh, clearly as as americans we don't understand greek things because i still don't know what omicron is i haven't figured it out right so i don't know so uh they they basically uh they, you know, they, they use the McDowell Dowell's approach, uh, essentially. So 80 plus, which is the one that everybody recognizes, they see it as actually the brand of value. I want the 80 plus sticker. Y- you got the cybernetic sticker. It's, it's a cybernetics eight, uh, something gold. So like, oh, you got 80 plus gold. They got cybernetics gold, like Etta gold or something like that. And it's like, okay. so it's like, they got the big Mac. We got the big Mac. It's just like. Is they got the big, you got the big king over there, yeah. man. That's that's what you're getting at, at the, the Burger King these days. Um, so, okay. So since we talked about power consumption, I mean, that to me, that was the million dollar question coming in here. You talk about 13th gen Intel having performance advantages in some contexts. How many extra watts are they sucking down to achieve those? It, it depends. So it could be, and I, I think that this is one of those things where you know, I, I actually saw the same thing happen with 12th gen and the internet meme that came out and the narrative that ran away was, oh my God, these Intel CPUs, like your lights will brown out when you you start, if you're doing something. And I will say, let me pull up an actual chart. So I'm just not making something up here, but like, I'm going to look at this blender load. So I, I ran blender and there's, there's a lot of things to this conversation. This is only the 13900K, which is where you're really, you're really pushing it to the edge. but um. So for reference, a Ryzen 9 7950X, uh, total system power, this is the complete system, maybe pushing uh, 340 watts under load while we'll, we'll rendering uh, a, a scene in, in Blender 3.3. Uh, and of course, remember the Ryzen 7950X, people were kind of losing their shit because like, oh my God, it's using so much more power than a 5950X because a 5950X would have been like 200 and 20 watts or something like that. So 7950X was considerably more power, also considerably fast. Much It's like 40% faster than the 5950X, same core count too. So we get to basically 13th gen, and there's two ways to look at this. So uh, when you put your 13th gen CPU into a motherboard and you, you build your new machine, um, Intel has a spec that they publish. It's not really a spec. It's more of a guideline that's like, okay, well, this chip is... You know, if you look on Intel's page, it will say the Core i9-13900K is uh, a 253 uh, watt uh, uh, TDP, right? So that is what, like I tested at 253, which is kind of stock. But if you buy any any motherboard that costs a lot of, like any high-end motherboard, they're going to say, oh, we're just going to take that 
recommend that guideline. It's like Pirates of the Caribbean. It's just a guideline. It's not a rule. And and crank it to the, the skies. So, but testing it at the Intel spec of of 253 PL1, PL2, you're looking at maybe 420 watts up from AMD's uh, 340. So suddenly <laughs> Ryzen 9 7950X, not looking so bad, honestly. But the crazy thing is when you run unlimited PL1, PL2, which a lot of the very high-end motherboards are doing because, you know, MSI. What is PL1, Gordon? PL1, so PL2? those are, you could think of them uh, as, well, they're power limits, but you could think of them as sort of gears that the CPU shifts at. So like, but it's in reverse. So like you would, you would have a PL2 in the older days, you would have a PL2 that might be like for a CPU in a laptop, it might be like, so like, Hey, this is a 15 watt um, TDP chip. Oh, it's 15 watt T PDP, uh, TDP, but the, the PL2 for that, which is basically the first gear that it starts in might be 80 Watts. So you could actually have this little two and a half pound laptop that the, the, the PL1 is, is uh is 65 watts which is like, if you think about it, it's like wow that's a lot of wattage but it's like it is like is like milliseconds like so it's, it's like a momentary spike and then the heat dissipates yeah and, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. A, so then it's you crank kind of a, down to your pl2 you sort of shift down to your second gear and like okay we're gonna run up to 65 watts for you know like uh five milliseconds and then now we're gonna shift down to say 28 watts for uh 56 seconds yeah so then, those are basically yeah. sort of your gears. But with with twelfth gen, they they kind of at the high end they did away with that. Basically, they say the, the way to describe it is PL one equals PL two. Basically, it runs forever. I think the easiest way to understand it is like the CPUs are so smart they manage it all themselves. But they manage it all themselves, but they do that at the behest of the motherboard. The motherboard tells them what to do. And by the way, ASUS, MSI, and Gigabyte like to sell you motherboards. You know what sells motherboards? They see a review and you're at that top of the list. So if you're the number one on the list of that, all the C790 boards or all the AMD motherboards, that's what people buy, right? Because you're in first. I don't, I don't want the, what, I'm not going to go to the race and buy the car that's number three, right? You want the one that's in first. So they push it as hard as they can. So when you push, but the thing is, so a lot of the reviews that you saw out there were like, oh man, unlimited. This sucker is like, so 13900K running Blender, it's pushing almost 500 watts. It's very impressive too, in a kind of cool way, because that's just a CPU load. This is not the GPU. So like, think of this like, so I don't have the exact number for a 5950X, but it might be 220, 230 watts. It's like taking the restrictor <laughs> off of a sports car. Yeah, no. And they, so they run it very hard. And a lot of people are like, holy shit, these things are really hot. But the other thing I do want to point out on the power consumption is like, wow, 500 watts is insane. And that's where, of course, you get all the memes. Like this thing is just stupidly, it's just throwing, Powered, and of course, you remember you put power into a chip; it comes out as heat, or whatever people yeah. want. But I, that's awesome in the winter, though. But um, I think people they kind of lost. You have to look at the whole picture. I I keep having discussions. I, I'm calling them nicely discussions with people on YouTube about this. Like, look, yes, if you're really going to sit there all day and use Blender or, or or you know any 3D renderer and really do batches and batches and hours and hours and hours, we're using every single core on a 13th gen. Yes you will use a lot of power and Ryzen 7000 will use definitely less power, especially if it's uncapped. But if you actually look at like things, well, I saw so I also recorded and we have a story up there, but if you actually look, um, I also log the power consumption of 13th gen and 7,000 and 12th gen and 5,000 where you're running say premiere. Right. And honestly, yeah, it's not a big deal. This is just taking, I remember I was talking about Puget Bench. You run Puget Bench, it runs like a 25 minute um, script uh, using Premiere, real world application. It does edits to it, it exports it. And then it's honestly not a big deal. Yeah, there's definitely times when uh, 13 Gen can use a lot more power when you're using all those cores. But the sad thing about our existence is it your people are buying 24 core and 16 core CPUs and you are very rarely ever using them all. So, and in fact, on light loads, 13th gen and even 12th gen can use less power than AMD. So, because of the efficiency cores? It could be the efficiency cores. It also could be, you know, they just idle with a little less power. And then, you know, for AMD, because they have their IO die, I saw some theory out there. It's like, it could be the IO die because IO die is always hot no matter what. So you have this piece of silicon that's, that's always hot on the chip. That could be it. I'm not really sure, but I think people need to step away from the narrative like, oh, Oh God, this thing is like, it's, it's going to light the earth on fire. 
yeah, it's going to light the earth on fire if you're going to sit there and run, you know, cinema 4D 23 hours out of the day. But are you really doing that? And most people are not. And if you look at Photoshop, Lightroom, you know, Premiere, browsing, you know, 13 Gen is really no different than, the, than AMD. The one, the one thing that people do do that hits the CPU and, and of course the GPU also over long periods of time is play games. I mean, I, I think the most multi-threaded game I've seen maybe hits six cores occasionally, but <laughs> yeah. Um, like what's the difference on, on the gaming side? So, uh, if you actually look at, because, so I did the same thing for using a couple of games. One is Horizon Zero Dawn and the other one is, uh, Metro Exodus. And, you know, you basically record the amount of power it uses, uh, during those runs. And it's, and it's no big deal. And honestly, it's like 13 Gen and, and Ryzen Sub 1000. And you can look at the, you can look at the actual, I actually think it's nice because I like to see like, so I'm basically logging the power used, uh, with, you know, external logging watt meters well it's playing the game or while it's using the application it logs it every second i think that's more useful than simply looking at the peak power because i think realistically you get a better idea for it but honestly it's it's i yes if you are using the the like i think spider-man supposedly is going to use a lot use a lot of cores but there are very very few games that use it the vast majority of games unfortunately are very lightly to single threaded which i mean it sucks for us and again I think it's like why like you're kind of getting ripped off by paying for all these cores if you're, you know, playing games mostly because I, and I, I know people say like, oh, I play multi-world and I, I don't know, but I, I, I just know that in general for the vast majority of games that people do, it doesn't make that much difference because you know what's eating up all the power. So we're up, if you look at the results I have, I'm up over 500 watts, six, almost 600 watts with 3090s, right? So it's it's the gpu using most of the power and i i think people getting all excited about the power consumption of the cpus and gaming is i think it's it's not worth it i would like it if we actually got to the point where they were all using you know 16 or 18 threads and the home you really do have to have a bigger power supply then we can talk but reality is the applications and the games are not there yet unfortunately in my opinion, but, you know, maybe somebody else. I think a lot of people just kind of look at the memes of the fire and all that and, and get a little carried away by it. But it's, it's, if you really stand back and look at real world usage, it's not that big of a difference. Games are just traditionally hard to parallelize, right? In my understanding. Yes. Yeah. I mean, but, it, you know, it's funny that also like your game developers, they're not like, oh yeah, I, if you're a game developer, you, especially on PC, you develop for what everybody has. So you like Fortnite? Oh yeah, we're gonna we're gonna make a version of Fortnite that you have to have a Core i nine thirteen nine hundred K to run on and a forty ninety. It's like no, I want to make money. That's what they, you know, they making them all to run the absolute you know lowest common denominator. So it's just it's just not going to happen. I think it's it's really it turns out it was almost impossible to get a forty ninety CPU bound on even an uh, uh, like uh, to, to rather to not be CPU bound on everything that I tested with. So. Yeah, no, I'm I'm looking forward to because I I think like my opinion, frankly, for gaming, if you're looking at a Ryzen, if you're looking at a Ryzen nine or Core i nine for gaming with a forty ninety, uh, I who, why are you Do, even worried? Doesn't matter. <laughs> you you know, I mean, but that was with a thirty ninety. With a forty ninety, there might be more of a delta between the two. I. I'd have a hard time believing it to be that much of a difference, but I, I'm excited to see 4090 because 4090 really did set people back in their butts and go, holy shit, you know, this it's, thing is just it's, stupidly fast. It's the first time I remember seeing a performance delta like that in in the, like since the early days of video cards, right? Like since, since when exciting stuff happened every, every time a new, new chip came out. It's crazy, right? Yeah. I mean, this really was like NVIDIA flexing on everybody. I mean, it really, yeah. you got to respect that. They have a lot of haters because they always do so well they always win nobody likes dynasties they all they all want to tear you down and they <laughs> tell us how you feel about tom brady gordon you um, know i when you know what during their dynasty because i'm a raiders fan man i hate tom brady i absolutely hate tom brady <laughs> tom brady he's a cheater the patriots they're cheaters that's all it's in the league's always got against the raiders but i will say today i you know he's he's the greatest he's the greatest of all time there's no way I would ever put Joe Montana ahead of Tom Brady at this no. point. Right. I no. mean, he's just incredible. And like same thing, but I mean, he could be really good at the game and still suck though. That's the thing to remember. 
See, but I, I can step out of my, my fanboy hate and just, I can say like, indeed, Tom Brady is, Tom Brady is, is the greatest. He's incredible. Right. And I, even though I hate him, I'm a Raiders fan. I hate him. They, that was a fumble. Like how more could you not, how could you, how could you fumble the ball more? Maybe if like it fell on the field and exploded and then like confetti came out of it and then maybe fireworks. Is that like a fumble? What else would make that a fumble? You know? So yes, I hate Tom Brady, but I will also say, because if you ask me and I'm not being a fanboy, he's the greatest of all, you know, you can't, you can't say it. There's nobody else. He's still playing for God's sake. It's crazy. So, um, let's see. I mean, we, we haven't really dug into like what actually changed with these new CPUs. It seems like, it, like the, the, the Zen four stuff is, is architecturally really interesting. It seems like, and it seems like the, my, my, my read on the Intel stuff is it's kind of like more of the same, but faster, better, stronger. Is that, do you think that's fair? I mean, yeah. I mean, God, you know, the funny thing is I, I, I used to try to understand the, the micro architecture a lot more. Honestly, these days I've gotten to the point where like, you know, let me push the button and I'll tell you what's fastest. It's Show kind of funny, marks. but I, would, I do agree though, like, cause it, it is important because I think the problem is, you know, years and years of having all the really smart people and the people who make these things are like beyond smart. Like when they talk to us, I mean, for them, it must be like going out to talk to your cat, right? Because it's just like, they are so far above us as, as mere mortals. And there's a few of us in the tech press that can actually understand them. And they are super smart people. I kind of think like, but at the same time, yeah, AMD, it, you know, Ryzen 7000, you know, they, I think a lot of it's, they picked up from cash, you know, they, they actually have a breakdown from Austin, kind of like where they pick up this, uh, uh, Perf. I, where they picked up performance, like some is, you know, some of the IPC is a is micro micro architecture. Some of it's on, you know, process and all that. But but as I, I said, cash early, but they picked up a lot of it really just on the on the process, right? Because they they went to a new process for the IO die and and the uh, the CPU dies. I think that's where they got a lot of it. And also, you know, beyond the the magical tuning that very few of us can understand in the cores, they also they also used a socket that gave them more power because am4 was very limited with power right it was like 200 i can't remember what it was it was like 205 it was yeah, very low fat. yeah right and that honestly i think that kind of limited them because i was just saying today it's just like man you know if they if am4 wasn't so limited with power you know they probably could have pushed 59 you know 5,000 harder right but they just they just simply ran out of power at the socket so you combine all of the you know the magic of you know tsmc's best process you you take the designs to the chip itself. I think the cache is a little larger as well. All the all the tweaks, all this stuff, and then you add the fact that they have a socket that can give them more power. You know, and it's just a total package that gives them, you know, again, to go forty percent faster in multi core performance over your previous generation part that was also the same core count is incredible, right? But it's sort of like it's spread across all these different things, you know, and then also. You know, going to DDR5 probably helps them in some applications. There's just there's just a lot that goes into it. So I, I think it's I, I don't get too far down the the you know chip nerd talk stuff, but um and then for Intel, yeah, I would say it was less of a less radical than than AMD. They they are clearly Intel has clearly been hamstrung, you know, by process, right? This is again another Intel seven part, which is 10 nanometer, but you know, they've started like since nanometers don't really mean anything and they've turned into cynical marketing. You know, because like, oh, my God, TSMC five nanometers. Awesome. Is it, you know, Intel started, they've started doing this like six years ago. Like, well, what's a nanometer anyway? What does that mean? <laughs> right. And it's true because they're like, if you try to find out, like, it doesn't like, because not every single structure on the chip is five nanometer. There's some things that are much larger There's some things, you know, I, it really did come down to. And so they were pushing this thing like we want to have um, a metric for, you know, based on the density. So we want to have no transistors packed into like square millimeters. And that would be, because that would be, you know, more representative because you could, you could literally look at uh, the die and say, well, like this is five nanometer. Everything else here is 18, but this one's five. So it's fine. You know, they were, obviously they weren't doing that, but it's just, that was kind of their messaging. But, you know, a lot of people sort of saw that as proactive, like, oh shit, we're stuck here (laughs) at a 14 nanometer and we're never going to get off this. So we're going to start talking about this. So, but yeah, the, you know, Intel is on Intel, you know, seven, which is, you know, ostensibly Intel, you know, 10 nanometer. Uh, A lot of them, a lot of same things too, right? They're, they're, they're just giving you more They're You know, they went to a hybrid design 
because now you're getting before you got 16 cores out of 12th gen. Now you're getting 24. You're getting eight plus 16. So, so you're 16 getting, big cores and, and eight small cores. Yeah, uh, uh, eight, eight eight big cores because yeah, they're oh, multi-threaded. Eight, well, right, they, right. they don't call it big little because that's ARM's thing. So it's eight oh. eight performance cores and sixteen efficiency cores, and you're you're literally getting a crap load more cores, and that adds up, you know, in multi-threaded per- workloads because again, they're 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 right there with you know AMD, which essentially has sixteen, you know, uh, big cores or performance cores. So, do you, uh, do you do you have to do Windows eleven? You have to do Windows 11 to take advantage of the 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 performance and and efficiency cores, right? Uh, you know, it still works. I'm actually doing testing right now between Windows 10 and 11. I opted to do that to just find out, and uh, it still does work. I was kind of surprised because I was like, "Man, am I going to have to like run 85 things to find the 10 things that it's, there's a difference in?" And the first things I've I've run are, um, it's you know, Photoshop and. Premiere and Word, well, Office Suite stuff, and that's because I have a, a script I can run them all in uh, if, for UL's Procyon. And there is actually, I was kind of surprised. I thought it wouldn't make any difference. So the exact same 13 Gen box, I then threw a second, you know, another identical SSD into it and loaded Windows 10, and it looked like it was about five or six percent slower in Windows 10. I haven't had a chance to dive into all the numbers, but there was a real advantage going just to windows 11 and i'm not using the latest version of windows 11 which supposedly gives them more of a bump too so there is no thread director for windows 10 right uh well i mean thread director is internal to the cpu right so it should still do it it's it's the it's the hardware scheduler thing that windows 11 does yeah um, and it's improved in it i mean i that's why some people I, it makes me wonder like maybe some of amd's issues are you know they updated the scheduler and in windows 11 you know 22 h2 and maybe that's a side effect because you remember when ryzen 1000 came out there were weird performance issues with the original 1800s you know all the 1800x and down and um a lot of people it feels like it really came down to the windows scheduler of windows 10 at the time and that was an ancient version of windows 10 but uh AMD actually publicly came out and disavowed that. They said it is not Windows fault. It is not our pro- the problem the the performance issues you are seeing with the CPU are not are is not uh, Microsoft Windows fault. But I will say in this industry the any whenever the one company that is at the top of the food chain and I mean above Intel and above AMD and Nvidia is Microsoft. So it's very much AMD coming out and saying that it was not Windows fault is very much like I don't know uh, somebody shooting you in the face and you apologizing to that person for shooting you in the face. So that, I think it's very similar to that situation. So that's, that's kind of what happened. Nobody got my Dick Cheney reference. <laughs> Look, just because you say somebody got shot in the face doesn't mean it's always Dick Cheney, Gordon. But it usually well, is. But no, most people don't apologize for it. It's like, oh man, I shouldn't have stepped out. And, but we don't know. Maybe they're liquored up, but I'm just saying, you know. That was an unusual circumstance. It's like, oh man, I'm sorry. I, sh- I thought there was a bird behind you, but you know, I'm just Look, saying that's what happens. Important lessons. We nobody have to learn. Nobody will ever criticize Microsoft. So that's just the way it is. No hardware vendors will. Uh, Brad, how you feeling? You got anything else? Look, I could sit here and talk about undervolting all day. I've been, I, I have increasingly. A believer that undervolting is the new overclocking. <laughs> oh my god! I mean, look, AMD built it right into the BIOS this time. Like, where did the eco mode come from? Right. Well, it's funny because I mean, I have um, heated discussions with my uh, v- video producer Adam, who he's he's really big into uh, undervolting, and I, you know, sadly, I I. I want to hear Will's perspective because he's an old timer too. But so, like, undervolting is like everybody starts screwing about undervolting now, but to me, like. Undervolting is like a hypermiler. It's like this the sadness of an enthusiast like a, like a real like I love my PC. I'm going to I'm going to I love it so much. I'm going to is but they're like it's like hypermiling and I don't know if people know what hypermiling is. Hypermiling is a thing wired made up like 15 years ago. I don't even know if that was real, was it? What are the I'll tell you what it is. Is those a-holes in the freeway driving 47.8 miles an hour in their Prius. You know why? Cuz you're trying to get the maximum amount of miles, but you're like Look. get out of my way with your Prius. Those are the, and they're like, "Oh, I I don't want to I'm going to go down this hill. I don't want to get on the gas." So, Look, okay, here, here are my two reasons for undervolting my 3080. Number one, I had that power supply issue. It was it was crashing the machine from the transient spikes. Number two, started working from home full time and got a load of my power bill after running my PC for 
13 hours a day. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm not saying it's invalid. I'm just saying it's, it's kind of like to me, like the days of overclocking, like the days of like, oh, my God, I got this Intel CPU, sell around 300A. I paid $180 or $150 for it. And I overclocked it to 450 megahertz for free. And it runs there all day forever. Like that's like, oh, my God, that's just kind of free. Awesome. But now it's like. We've resorted to just simply well, now, like getting the maximum amount of the of the of the maximum performance at the lowest amount of power, which I I, I respect, but I just kind of think it's like it's just a, a little sad from the days like when you used to jump in your V eight and you'd go down the freeway and like oh my god, secondary's open up, I got like twelve miles of the gallon. It's like awesome. Undervolting is definitely the thing that people who overclocked in their youth and then got old moved to it's like it's like i'm not i'm i'm too old for overclocking now but here's something else i can tweak no i i agree yeah for for me like i'm curious right like if if there's really like i, I play competitive game like i play i mean you're gonna mock me now gordon but I, i've been playing fortnite and like frames even in fortnite frames matter right like i have this stupid 360 hertz monitor and like the difference between 120 frames per second and 240 frames a second is how quickly I land flick shots. Right. Like right. I, I hit them much better when the frame rate is higher. So if I can crank down the amount of heat that comes out of that computer, like I, I, I literally, I, I thought about rearranging my office so I could just cut a hole in the wall and pipe the heat outside. Um, but cause it, it gets toasty in here. Um, and if I can get equivalent performance at like without making the room a sauna, I'm kind of into it. Um, no, I, I no, I get it. I get it. Yeah, that's that's where I like. I'm granted 3080 is a two year old card now, but I went from I, it was it was settling around 320 330 watts playing games. I, I got it down to about 250 260 with like basically no change in performance. My stupid computer will use like it just idles at like 200 watts, so it's just kind of like I don't. <laughs> yeah. Um, but like, like, you know, it, it seems like, I mean, Ryzen 7000, like definitely has the performance per watt crown, correct? Like I, I see people saying like, oh, you use eco mode, drop it to 105 watts and it's still significantly faster than, than the 5000s. Uh, oh, over 5000. Yeah, I would say, I think it comes down to, and the thing is about 13th gen, you can really tune it nicely too. I mean, I think the Bauer came out of the video. He was, uh, he's a famous German overclocker, but he, he is very impressed by a tuned 13th gen for power efficiency. Um, and performance too. So I, I don't really know what the answer is. I, I did do a little bit of testing around it and there's somewhat comparable. I think it probably comes down to how you, you tune it, but then, you know, I think it still comes down to also what you're using the computer for. So, but no, I, again, I, I'm just talking a little shit, just saying the well, the sad <laughs> days of overclocking of like, you know, you look back like some, you know, you're looking at some 70, 72 charger and what we've, what we turned into look, now is like, Oh my look, God, you know what? Look, man, you can put a two barrel I've, carb on that thing, get an extra five miles a gallon out of but it. But now it's like, I've hacked my Prius to add it. Uh, you know, they didn't allow us to plug it in, <laughs> but I added the plug in like, oh, that's so awesome. Right. But it's Look, it's just a little different. Gordon, I'm going to tell you when I drove the bolt down from Truckee and I and the kilowatts per, per mile, uh, sorry, the miles per kilowatt hour was 55 coming down the hill. And it's usually like three. I was pretty excited. Like that was fun. That I was know, stupid, no, I mean, but, but it's pretty it's, good. I know. It's just, it's just a different, it's a different kind of fun that is, uh, it's, it's old, old guy fun. <laughs> is that so? what you basically made power all the way down then, did it? Yeah, we did made you, power. The, well, so, so, but I mean, the thing about the thing, the place, I mean, you, you, I mean, maybe you don't remember, but like I was the person who put water cooling in my PC at, at maximum PC because I wanted it to be quiet and, and not hear it. You know, I, I didn't want to hear. I didn't want to hear the leaf blower of the 5800 when when I when I fired up Doom 3 or whatever the game was that year. And and you know, I've I've as I've become more reliant on my PC as like a thing that I use for work and and not just you know dinking around with games, it, it's become much more about reliability and noise than than any like those are the two main things for me at this point is it i want it to be re consistently reliable and i need to be able to sit here with with a big stupid microphone and have the computer going full speed and not have it make a lot of noise on on whatever i'm working on so yeah um it's anyway it's always gordon it's always wonderful to have you here thank you so much for taking the time to come by and, and kind of give us the the rundown on the current uh, run of cpus I, I think everything's up on the website at pcworld.com uh, that we talked about. Like your your AMD and Intel write ups are both there. You've got videos for both, I believe. Yep. Um, PC World's uh, YouTube channel. 
And and uh, you're on the Full Nerd Weekly these days. Yeah, pretty much. I think. Well, I don't. I wouldn't say reliably. Usually Tuesdays. Sometimes Wednesdays. Sometimes Thursdays. <laughs> found, <laughs> found wherever fine pro- podcasts uh, can can be found. Um, uh, uh, thank you. Thank you. And Twitter, uh, fake Gordon Ung. Yes. Yeah, still the, it still actually says fake. That's still a leftover from the future days. Fake Gordon Mong. So yeah. Um, there we go. Uh, Gordon, thank you so much for coming by. It's always, always a pleasure to see you. Thanks for having me. Uh, as always, Brad, we've reached the time of the show where we thank our patrons. We have. Thank you, patrons. Thank you, patrons. If you would like to find out how you can, can, can support uh, Brad will make a tech pod, which is a 100% listener supported show. You can go to the website, patreon.com slash tech pod. And for as little as $2 a month, you can contribute to, to the show and gain access to the fabulous tech pod discord, which is full of beautiful nerds who talk about wonderful things mm-hmm. all the time. Uh, do you know, you know yeah. what? There's been a lot of chatter on there about recently is new CPUs. Oh, I thought it was going to be undervolting. Oh, oh, that's coming up too. There's, there's undervolt. There's some undervolting talk. We talked a lot about video cards last week. Um, I, I so I, I didn't bring it up with Gordon, but the I I I think the concept of undervolting is about to hit the mainstream. Basically, like I'm st- I'm starting to see like some tweets floating around about the 4090 from like not people who are just in tech press or tech YouTubers. I don't know about the mainstream. Well, not maybe not mainstream, but people who don't review hardware for a living is what I mean. Like I think I feel like. Mm. non PC hardware obsessive type people are now starting to see like, Oh, what do you mean? I could run 60% of the electricity for 90% of the performance. Like that sounds good to me. Like, I wonder if that's going to actually start catching on. I I think, I mean, I I feel like the people who are in the market for the high end hardware and the people who are care about the amount of power their computers are using is like, there's, there's a very little overlap on that Venn diagram, but I think, I think, I don't think you're wrong. That's fair. That's fair. I listen, I, a lot of this is colored by how much warmer it is in my home office than the rest of the apartment. The, the thing, honestly, the thing I want is for the manufacturers to look at this and think, oh, this is a trend. We should be, we should be supporting this. Yeah. Cause like, realistically, this is the default way stuff should ship. And then if you want to juice it the other way, then you should have that option. But you're exactly right. And like, I think he, he was right to lay blame on the motherboard makers because like I, I did a ton of research on this Ultra Lake chip I got for my NAS and like Intel sets pretty reasonable defaults on the PL1, PL2 and Tau values. Yeah. The Tau is the amount of time before it goes from the high gear to the low gear. Yeah. But then, like he said, the motherboard makers just take all those limiters off because they want to look the fastest on paper and sucks anyway uh th- the tech pod discord is a great place full of uh, highly technical cool. people who can yeah. talk to you about this and, and many other topics and and uh every week we like to thank our executive producer tier patrons uh including paddle creek games makers of fractured veil andrew slosky uh hashtag bunny slimes reluctant meme participant wedge joel krauska twinkle twinkie and james kamek thank you also so much we really appreciate your support yes we do thank you and uh, on that note, uh, we will be back. We will be back next week with another episode of the Tech Pod. Uh, we are unclear. It's up in the air right now. It's probably a Q and A episode. So if you would like to do some Qs and have us turn them into As, you can do that by joining the Question Seeking Answers channel on the Discord and posting your your comment or question into the void there, or you can email them to techpod at content dot town. Uh, that's techpod at content.town. We would love to have feedback, questions, comments, social statements, whatever you feel like you need to share with us. Please put it in those, one of those two respective places and we will address it next week. We might just do a, an Android episode instead yeah. of next week. I think we, we, we might have a subject matter expert so we can finally do a real Android episode. Yeah, it it turns out it's hard. Like in the old days before the phones were so integrated, it was hard. It was easy to switch back and forth between different phones. And now the like the it's it's a it's a significant challenge to change from android to ios and back on a regular basis and maintain a functional phone life I, so. yeah when i mentioned a few months ago i got this new phone and i was like oh eSIM. now i don't have to worry about a little thing i can just like go on the website and transfer service and then later i was like oh wait now i don't have a sim i could just stick in another phone when i feel like it here's the thing when you see depending on your carrier when you would take a sim and stick it in another phone sometimes they would just charge you 30 dollars because it's activating a new device on their network cool and you probably wouldn't notice because who looks at their phone bill yeah anyway uh but we'll be back next week with another episode of the tech pod thanks uh, again to gordon for coming by it was always lovely to visit with gordon and uh we will see everybody next week bye